Uh, good to be with you um, at the end of a long day. Uh, so I am grateful for being on first because then I can go and have my second beer in front of the television, which will be lovely. Um, I was asked to reflect on ICSA, which um, is always an interesting thing to be asked to do. Um, I wrote some reflections literally on the day the report came out. Um, some of you may have been conscious of the report coming out on the day it was published. Others of you, it will have just appeared in the news feed later that day. I set aside a couple of hours to read it and then had a sort of number of media interviews to do. And I scribbled away some thoughts, which in the end the Church Times put uh, on their website. And you may see it in another form uh, coming out in our diocesan magazine as well. And my question that I asked when the report came out was, how can our culture have been rotten for so long? And how can we have failed to see and hear? The ICSA report into the Anglican church highlights how our neglect of the physical, emotional and spiritual well-being of children and young people was allowed to carry on because we favored protecting our reputation over the protection of those children and young people. And this is just so hard to take in, in a way, I think, for some people, because we were criticized rightly in the report for setting ourselves up as some sort of moral authority, for claiming to know right from wrong, um, for acting in a way that taught people how to behave, told people how to behave, and yet at the same time, we overlooked, shunned those who were being abused within our own institution. Um, what the report didn't pick up on, because it was effectively a secular review, was the enormous contrast between our behaviour and that of Christ. And so we abused and ignored and re-abused those very people who Jesus stood alongside. We just did exactly what wasn't Christ-like. And that's a huge issue for us. Um, I suppose in a way, I'm almost the wrong person to talk about ICSA because I lived and breathed the actual inquiry, reading the transcripts or watching the uh, inquiry as it went on in between the day job and um, talking to survivors over the last few years. Um, and so I was completely unshocked by what was in the report. Um, whereas many other people were horrified and were facing for the first time some of the stories that, yes, they'd been around on the media. There'd been a documentary about Peter Ball and the Chichester Diocese that was very powerful. Some people had read uh, Letters to a Broken Church, which was produced by some survivors. Um, some people engage on social media with these issues, but for many of us, we've got on with the day jobs that we have and with worshipping on a Sunday and perhaps doing our safeguarding training, but not really engaged to that extent. And that's fine. Uh, but I do understand that I'm sort of coming at it from a different place. Much of the report is about the national church, although the stories that are used as examples within it are real and they are within diocese and they could equally have highlighted stories from our own diocese. So many of you will know about the Kendall House report where Canterbury and Rochester diocese ran a home for children and young women um, and that report uh, quite rightly highlights how um, those girls were abused physically, sexually, emotionally, and were drugged across three decades. Um, that is a story from our own diocese. And there are survivors from that who will be part of the uh, response to ICSA in a way, where the Church of England very quickly uh, put together an emergency support uh, project for victims who had not only been abused in the church, but who the church had failed when that abuse had been reported. So don't for a moment think that ICSA is about other dioceses. It's not. It's about all of us and all the dioceses. Um, 
the bits in the report that are pointing out things that could be done better at a local level, we've already picked up on really. Um, as I say, there were no surprises. So there's a section in there about how uh, within clergy reviews, we should be looking at safeguarding. And so um, we will be changing what is our review paperwork to make sure that that's picked up in the Archdeacon's review year that, our cl that clergy have. Um, there's a section about the role of safeguarding advisors, how they should be called safeguarding officers and how they should work in a way that allows them to uh, not be blocked by senior clergy, let's put it that way. Um, and immediately on the publication of the report, we started to review the role descriptions, uh, the grading, the job titles of um, our lead safeguarding officer. Um, and uh, I can reassure you that actually we don't block Greg or Caroline or Claire in the team. Um, that they have backing and that part of my role as the bishop's lead for safeguarding is to ensure that nobody, not even a bishop, can stand in the way of reports being made to the statutory organisations and safeguarding action being taken. Um, so um, in terms of local things, um, we are picking up on them and uh, that will be reported into uh, Diocesan Synod um, and Bishop's Council and you will see those small changes taking place. Um, I suppose the really big question for me is how we change the culture. Uh, and it's really easy to say we'll focus on culture change and do nothing because it's really hard to measure. Um, the only way in which you change culture is through systematically training people, having the right policies in place, making sure that churches understand what they need to do um, and through chipping away at it really and that's the slightly more nebulous bit of all of that and so you're chipping away at the things that were highlighted particularly from the Diocese of Chichester and if you read the content of the report and I do recommend it not just the summary conclusions and recommendations there is a really good section on culture focusing around the Chichester Peter Ball investigation where it highlights a number of things that have contributed us to us being so bad at safeguarding. So things like our clericalism. So historically, the father knows best approach and um, a tendency to trust clergy um, and not to question and not to challenge or to accept what they say. Um, what's described as tribalism, which is a term I'm not very comfortable with, but it's that group mentality where we don't act as though accountable to each other. We tend to uh, form into groups of like-minded uh, Christians around church tradition. And so there is a distrust across the national church and even across deaneries and dioceses. And we fall short because of that, because we don't have that challenge. We don't learn from each other in the way that we should. And people close ranks when they hear a story that would bring their grouping into disrepute, they close ranks because they are fearful about the implications of that. And that's a really powerful factor. There's also a naivety. We were criticized for being naive. And I think some of that naivety comes out of our sense of um, understanding about forgiveness and reconciliation, and yet failing to understand uh, the reality of people who will offend again and again and again and will groom whole congregations uh, into believing that they are wonderful people whilst using that as an opportunity to abuse people. So there was that and also our secrecy about sexuality was highlighted, our inability to talk openly about things that other people talk much more openly about. Um, the way in which we operate that can at times force people to be secretive and in a really unhealthy way and our fear of sexuality as well. So it's worth reading the content because some of the big questions about how we change that culture mean that we need to engage with some of those more difficult issues and engage in a really constructive way. 
Um, you'll have seen that since the ICSA report into the Anglican Church uh, was published, there's been one this week into uh, the Roman Catholic Church in Britain, um, which is probably also worth a read. I can't yet face it, so I'm sort of pacing myself uh, slightly. Um, but it's equally uncomfortable with equally uncomfortable case studies and lessons to be learned. Uh, don't take any comfort from how anybody else has done it badly, because we really have done it badly as well. Um, and so that's really what I wanted to say in terms of flagging up, A, that we are acting on the report, but also to encourage you to engage with it and particularly to engage with those sections about culture, because I think there are some really big questions to ask and in terms of how we make our churches healthier and safer.